Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you. Could I have your attention, please? Thank you, everyone. Just before we do get officially underway and we launch our report, um, we're just going to receive a, a welcome to country. I'd like to welcome up, she's coming up behind me already. There you go. Senior Wajak Noongar Elder Elizabeth Hayden with the welcome to country. Thank you. Thank you. I usually cut a gin, ngam, meow, ginangan, me and Nicky yagging, and ginangan nunuk. Nicky nunuk yagging, nunga budja. Wajak budja. Ngan Nicky ngan murt, kura, palap Nicky yin. Palap gin, kulin, Nicky nunga budja. Poke a cape. Kept up Nichinin over near that river, our people camped along that river a long time ago. Palapakurunga, did you get Kidinin? Palapakurunga, Nanin, Nicha, Kep, Nin, Ulu Nichiagin. I'm not a nunuk, Nichi nunukawangin, not a nunukawangin. Nichi. I'm wondering, Nichi, nunuk, nunga buja. First off, I welcome you to nunga buja, to this country. I don't know whether you are visitors to this. I don't think there are any visitors because the borders are closed. So I would imagine that you're all Perth people or around the state. Let me say that um, I welcome you to Nyunga country. I look around and I <coughs> look to see if I know anybody. I really don't know anyone around here, so. But I know you came from Curtin. You're representing Curtin. And I've been at Curtin doing a few studies there myself. Probably the only university that's worth going to. Nah, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> But um, yeah, I've had a choice this year to go to, to finish off a PhD, to go to um, Edith Cowan. I've been welcomed over to U UWA, but um, I've made many uh, little paths, bitty gulling around Curtin, so that's where my feet take me back there to finish off what I'm hoping to finish is a PhD. Let me tell you that a long time ago our people walked on this land. I just need to remind people. I often do welcomes to country, but I never do it without reminding people that this is a land that Nyungar people walked on. This is a land that they sat with their children on. You're sitting here eating in very sophisticated manners. Well, not quite sophisticated, because there are better tables. I've seen places of food around the place and setups. But you're sitting in a very, very um, nice area. Our people sat on the river on the sides of the river, and they sat with their children. They ate with their children, they laughed, they loved. On the river is where their footprints you will not see. But our history says that they were on the river. And when I think about that, I think how strong and resilient our people have been to actually still be on this land. And we still go and sit near the river, have barbecues and that where you're sitting up here in higher places. But let me tell you that I would encourage you to go touch the earth. Go touch the earth. The earth that's beneath you. You're here talking about connectedness, isolation, loneliness, social connectedness. These are things that our people have suffered from for a long, long time. Isolation, you know, the policies were separation and isolation. Loneliness, a lot of our people are out there very lonely because they don't have the right um, supports and structures around them to help them. But let me tell you, the one thing that I value in these four 
little things is connectedness. One of the things that Aboriginal people have, they were always connected to each other. They were always connected to each other by kinship, by family, relationships. And that's, that connectedness is a very powerful thing. And through the time of COVID, you couldn't stop and really, you couldn't stop a Nunga from meeting another Nunga, regardless of what was said. You know, you've got to stay in your house, you can't go out. That was our survival, was to be connected to each other in a time that was really difficult when COVID came. Oh well. The notion of COVID hit us and it caught up with a few people. <clears throat> but connectedness, isolation, loneliness, those are important factors. I'm sure that the stuff that you found out, whatever you found it in your research, I hope that there is a strong, strong pull towards looking and recognising the isolation of Aboriginal people, the loneliness of Aboriginal people and the social disconnection of Aboriginal people. We certainly need to be connected to the wider community and there are steps and bounds within the place now, within Western Australia, for a stronger connectedness. We need to have a strong connection because our land is suffering from discontent. And this, this I guess, disconnectedness because we are not connected to our land. And one of the things that our land will survive by is if we start to get back and be connected to our land. So I wish you all a great day. I hope that whatever the report presents it, it will be, I'm sure it will be a good report. Um, nothing gets put out so elegantly as good reports. Um, I tried to have a quick look through, um, but those were the four things that caught my eye. And so I wish you well. I hope that um, you will remember to not leave out the Aboriginal community when you do your research and that you will include them, that there will be an inclusiveness. And I'm sure somebody will come and tell me, well, here's a chapter on Aboriginal people. Well, that's fine. You can come and show me that. But if you haven't got it there, I wonder why. So have a great day. Um, have a great lunch together and have great conversations around. Nonokada Wang and Murich. Nonoka Miao, Nichi Jinaman. Nonok. Nonoka Jen, Gurlin, Debakan, Gur. Nonoka Mar, Nichi Murich Mar. Karajan. Karajan, Winji Nonoka Da, Jinong. Karajan, Winji Nonoka. Jen, Gurlin. Karajan. Winji Nonoka Miao, Jinong. Karajan. Karajan. Thank you. Thank you very much to Elizabeth, and I know you're a big promoter of the Noongar language and keeping it alive, so thank you for that beautiful welcome to country. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the launch of the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre report, Stronger Together, Loneliness and Social Connectedness in Australia. My name is Mark Gibson, I'm a broadcaster and journalist, and it's my pleasure to be your Master of Ceremonies here for the launch of this report this afternoon about such an important topic we know, especially given what has happened in the world in the past couple of years, uh, and we're not just looking at the impacts of COVID here, and we're not just talking about the world, but this is a great opportunity with this research to talk about Australia, and specifically today, Western Australia. So a very big welcome to all of our guests today. I'd just like to acknowledge a couple of distinguished guests, Meredith Hammett, MLA, the member for Mirabooka. Senior leaders from Bankwest and Curtin University and across the WA business community. And a shout out to some students today. We have students from Rockingham Senior High School and Presbyterian Ladies College. Welcome to you. Um, I think it's especially important that our students are here today because one of the key areas of this research around connectedness, loneliness, revolves a fair bit around technology. Get your questions ready and maybe tell us, is technology making us more or less connected. We'll throw it over to our bright students today as well. We do have some wonderful speakers to hear from and our panellists for today. So shortly you will hear from Professor Alan Duncan, the director of the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre, and Associate Professor Astrik Mavisakalyan, the Principal Research Fellow, Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre. 
and our expert panel with a diverse range of knowledge and expertise. We have Christine Allen, the Chief Executive Officer, the Council on the Aging, Western Australia. Brendan Cullinan, Chief Executive Officer, People with Disabilities, Western Australia. And Nick Maisie, Chief Executive Officer of Befriend. Now, Nick is a late addition to our panel, so you won't find him in the program, but we're thrilled that you stepped up at the last minute, Nick, and uh, that you could take part in our panel discussion today. So would you please make all our speakers and panellists feel welcome? Now, just a couple of short housekeeping measures. Um, I'm sure by now you've checked in using the Safe WA app or the contact register. It's really important that you do that. And we just ask today that you do try to maintain some physical distancing wherever possible and also good personal hygiene. Uh, and we ask that if you're not feeling well, please just let one of the event staff know and they can help you out. Uh, I would ask that you please make sure your phones are on silent. Uh, we don't want them turned off because we want you to use them to submit some questions shortly for our panel, but do please make sure that your phones are switched to silent. Now, in the unlikely event of an emergency, I just need to let you know that the venue has a two-tone alarm system. Um, now, I've never hosted an event where I've explained the difference between a beep beep and a whoop whoop, but that's what I'm about to do. There's the first warning tone is a beep beep. If you hear that sound, you need to uh, identify your nearest fire exit and prepare to evacuate. But the second warning tone is a whoop whoop sound. If you do hear that, that's the call to evacuate. So please, in that instance, leave your personal belongings behind and make your way in an orderly fashion to the nearest fire exit uh, and follow the instructions of venue staff. I know this is an unlikely event, but if it is, please identify your nearest exit, which might be behind you today. Thank you very much for that. Now, just briefly about the report. So, Stronger Together, Loneliness and Social Connectedness in Australia is the eighth report in the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre's Focus on the States series. Now, this report examines trends in social connectedness in Australia and assesses the implications for well-being and development. Loneliness, social isolation and disconnection do result in large health and economic costs. But which sections of society are at greatest risk of loneliness or isolation? And what drivers can mitigate loneliness and build up a sense of inclusion? These are some of the questions we'll hopefully answer for you today. Have technology and social media improved our sense of connectedness? Or have they left some of us with greater feelings of isolation? The Stronger Together report identifies actionable policies and strategies. This is really important. Actionable policies and strategies which can help strengthen Australia's social fabric, enhance the personal development of children and young adults, improve personal and community well-being, and support people to achieve their goals and reach their full potential. Now, in terms of those questions I mentioned briefly earlier, we encourage you to definitely submit your questions for our panel. You can do that from any time now. If you have anything that pops into your mind, we are using Slido, and all you have to do on your phone, I know many of you have done this before, you just need to go to www, and it's .sli.do. That's to, go, to get to Slido. And then enter the code, which is hashtag connectedbcec. If you could all do that, that would be great. S-L-I dot D-O and then the hashtag connected B-C-E-C. -E and if you're on social media and if you're tweeting about today's event, because let's be honest, we're talking about this, so this technological connectedness as well. If you haven't put it on social media, were you really even here? Um, we would encourage you to use Twitter today and just use the handle at Bankwest Curtain and the hashtag Again, connected BCEC. That would be great if you could give us a bit of social media love as well as we launch this report officially and discuss its findings. So we're in for an interesting afternoon of discussion and I would like to now invite John Hart, the Chief Risk Officer at Bankwest, to the stage to deliver the opening address. Please make John very welcome. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Elizabeth, for that incredible welcome to country to start our event today. Indeed, thank you for welcoming us to this land. 
I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. And in the spirit of reconciliation, I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to all of our uh, distinguished guests in attendance today. And on behalf of Bank West, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here today. Bank West has been a part of the fabric of Western Australia for more than 125 years. And we are committed to building a brighter future for all. With safety and security and guidance and support, we're here for our over 1.1 million customers nationwide when they need us most, and particularly for those who are more vulnerable. Now in its ninth year, our support for the Bankwest Curtin Economics Center performs an integral part of our ongoing support for the communities and economy of Western Australia. The social and economic research produced by the center is helping to inform and shape public debate and policy on critical issues impacting both our great state and our great nation. Today we launch the final, or the, the, yes, the final Bankwest Curtin Economics Center report for 2021, Stronger Together, Loneliness and Social Connectedness in Australia. This report is incredibly timely and important. It explores the themes of loneliness, belonging, and connection, and the impact the pandemic has had on the lives and livelihood of Australians. Even though reporting in the early days of the pandemic suggested that we'd be living with it for years, I'm sure that there were many of us, like myself included, that thought that this life of lockdowns and isolations surely wouldn't go on that long, but here we are, we've already ticked off one year and we're almost ready to tick off a second year of dealing with this. And of course, loneliness and social connection issues existed before the pandemic and they will remain once it has passed us, but both have been significantly affected by the pandemic. But those effects perhaps weren't immediately obvious there was an initial novelty to life with COVID, which showed up in our Bankwest spending data. People seemed to embrace isolated exercise. Bike shops were booming. Hardware and homeware stores did a roaring trade as we all got off on those DIY projects that we'd been putting off for so long. And modern technology made loneliness and so social connection feel like it might not be such a problem with FaceTime calls with family and friends overseas and uh, Microsoft Teams meetings with all of our work colleagues. And during the pandemic, Advocare noted an increase in people stepping up to volunteer for their community visitors scheme, which connects volunteers with older West Australians who are socially isolated with the aim of improving the quality of their lives through companionship. But 20 months is a long time. And the impacts of the challenges can gradually turn from manageable to impeding. Feelings of isolation and loneliness can be triggered by an inability to function in the world in ways that we're used to which was evident for many older Australians unfamiliar with the digital world, forced into new and at times overwhelming technology for the first time just to shop, pay bills, or do their banking. And that's why at the height of the pandemic, we proactively contacted more than 8,000 customers aged over 60 who had little or no history of digital banking to set up and walk them through the digital banking options available to them so that they didn't feel like they had to make a choice between remaining in the safety of their home and visiting a bank branch for transactions that many of us do on our phones. And this increased risk of social isolation for vulnerable members of our community was also exposed in SCAMS data that was released recently uh, for both SCAMS Awareness Week 
and Seniors Week. In a statistic that speaks to the heart of today's report, one of the most common scams targeting older Australians was romance scams, a crime that preys on our human need for social connection, on our desire to be loved, on our need to avoid loneliness. And the past 20 months amplified our awareness of another critical concern of loneliness and social connectedness, again, which existed before COVID and will do so after, but which increased in prevalence as a result, and that is family and domestic violence and financial abuse. While many of us relished extra time at home with those we loved, the reality for others was far different. Nationally, more than 40% of family and domestic violence agencies reported a significant growth in controlling and coercive behavior due to the pandemic, with perpetrators using it as another form of control to further isolate abused women and children. And as next Thursday marks the beginning of the 16 Days in WA campaign to end gender-based violence, I'm proud to say that Bankwest will be standing alongside the state government and other community organizations to raise awareness of this social epidemic. As contradictory as it may sound, being at home in the presence of others can sometimes make people feel increasingly isolated, lonely, and cut off, especially when home is not a safe place to be. I'd like to think that we've become more mindful of those who face isolation and loneliness in their everyday life, and more mindful of the impact that that's, this has on them and on our society. We know that loneliness leads to poor physical and mental health, and in some cases, even premature death. Some theorists go so far as to say that psychological isolation is the most terrifying and destructive feeling that a person can experience. So what can we do about it? I know that today's report will launch, well, today's report launch will delve into some of the critical issues and opportunities of loneliness and belonging, of social inclusion and connectedness and I hope it will encourage and shape debate about how we can truly strengthen Australia's social fabric in the future. If this pandemic has taught us one thing, it's that we want to be more compassionate and connected. We shouldn't have to wait for the next disaster to bring out the best in us. So thank you, Professor Alan Duncan and Associate Professor Astrid Mavisaklian for your work on this very important and timely report. I very much look forward to hearing from you shortly and from the panel discussion that will follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for those opening remarks, which were so relevant to what we're about to discuss in a bit more detail throughout this lunch. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will just pause for about 15 or 20 minutes for you to enjoy some lunch and a catch-up, and then we will have uh, the report's findings presented to you and a panel discussion about them. Don't forget to submit those questions. I'll remind you again after lunch, and I look forward to the discussion then. Thank you. So, I'd like to introduce John Curtin Distinguished Professor Alan Duncan, the Director of the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre, and Associate Professor Ashtik Mavisakalyan, Principal Research Fellow at the Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre. They will report, uh, present the report's findings. Please make them welcome. Thank you, Mark, and, um, and thank you all for joining us um, for today's launch. Um, we really appreciate your interest in uh, Bankwest Curtin Economic Centre's Stronger Together report. Uh, Ashton and I are going to uh, 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 enjoy sharing some of the main findings from our research, but before we do, um, uh, we'd also like to acknowledge and thank the, um, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today, and pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. We'd also like to acknowledge our co-authors on this report, Daniel Kiley, Austin Peters, Richard Seymour, Chris Toomey, and Loan Booth, and the many stakeholders whose insights have helped shape the research that we're presenting today. Social connectedness, 
It goes to the heart of what holds our communities together and strengthens us personally. Issues of social connectedness speak to our sense of identity, trust, and belonging. So this report looks at patterns of social connectedness in Australia and assesses issues of social isolation and loneliness across different sections of our society. But why now? Well, there's never been a more important time to talk about the power of social connectedness and the risks of social isolation. Nearly three million people in Australia report being lonely most of the time, and that's gone up 800,000 in the last 10 years. And of course, COVID-19 has amplified these trends with enforced isolation, uncertainty about work and income, the inability to plan for the future, and the threat of serious illness or worse. So in this report, we look at the concept of social connectedness and what it means for the health, well-being, and life opportunities for those that have it and for those that don't. We look at the role of social connectedness in building personal and community resilience. We identify groups who are especially vulnerable to loneliness or social isolation and why. We think about how to combat loneliness and disconnection and who has a role to play. Governments, businesses, community organizations, and all of us in this room. So let me hand over to Ashid now to talk about how we look at the concept of social connectedness in this report. Ashley. Thanks, Alan. We're social beings. Some of the happiest episodes in our lives are linked to sharing time with family, friends, neighbors, and community. Conversely, in times of crisis, our social connections often serve as safety nets. The relationships we develop over time are also seen as a form of investment that can be leveraged for material gain, such as finding a job or getting access to valuable information. So what is the current state of social connectedness in Australia? There are many potential factors that affect the degree to which people see feel socially connected within their communities. This presents a challenge in picking up the underlying domains of social connectedness. To resolve this challenge, we take a data-driven approach and statistically identify the domains that capture the connectedness. What emerges from this analysis are four domains that form the basis of a unique composite index of social connectedness we develop. This includes social interactions, frequency of engagement with family, friends and neighbors, participation in community and volunteering. The index captures social support for individuals, which includes having someone to confide in or lean on in times of trouble, someone to cheer them up or extend help when needed. We look at trust among each other, measured by whether people believe that those around them keep their word, make honest agreements, are trustworthy and helpful, the index also captures those socioeconomic factors that are likely to affect connectedness, such as resources available to individuals or the characteristics of their communities. The index shows that levels of social connectedness are going down, both for men and women and across all age cohorts. We find that men on the left here are consistently below women presented on the right in the level of their social connectedness. We find that people are more connected at later stages of their lives, with those aged 55 to 64 showing the highest levels of connectedness. However, this cohort has also experienced one of the largest drops in the index between 2010 and 2018, alongside those aged 15 to 17 and 25 to 34. So we want to understand why has this happened? To answer this question, we look at the changes in different dimensions of connectedness experienced by the three age cohorts. We see that social interactions have dropped the most for all three groups. Men and women in the younger age cohorts have also gone through a significant drop in their social support. However, in the older age cohort, the drop in social support is much more pronounced for men, shown in orange. Interpersonal trust has gone down for both men and women across the three cohorts but we see hardly any changes in socioeconomic factors affecting connectedness. Now, not everyone in society shares the same level of social connectedness. Based on our index, social connectedness of indigenous Australians on the left here is around 39% lower compared to non-indigenous Australians. All four dimensions of connectedness contribute to this difference. However, we observe the largest difference in the levels of interpersonal trust presented in TEAL. It is important to note that the index is based on responses to survey questions that mainly reflect indigenous people's engagement and trust with the wider Australian community. In that respect, the index is unable to capture the strong connection of indigenous Australians to family, community, culture, and the land. Now back to Alan. 
COVID-19 has brought into sharp focus uh, another pandemic building in Australia, a pandemic of loneliness. As I mentioned, nearly 3 million Australians feel lonely most of the time, a figure that has risen more than 800,000 over the last decade. We find self-reported loneliness to be consistently higher for women than for men across all ages. But the gender loneliness gap is especially large for the very young and seniors. 22% of young women under the age of 18 report being very lonely compared to 14% of young men. That's a difference of eight percentage points. For women, loneliness reduces in middle age but picks up again from age 55, while for men it starts low for the young but picks up slowly to age 45 before flattening. We find the gender loneliness gap to again increase over the later stages of life, which may well coincide uh, with life transitions from loss of a partner or retirement. This is a finding that concerns us a great deal. People with a disability are consistently more likely to feel lonely and a lot more lonely than people without a disability. And that's across all ages and for both women and men. One third of women aged less than 18 with disabilities are lonely for much of the time as a three in 10 women age under 45. A quarter of young men with disabilities feel lonely, rising to three in 10 men aged under 45. And hearing impairment is the strongest driver of loneliness with 42% of men and 46% of women with this form of disability experiencing loneliness. Mobility issues also affect people, but younger people the most, with nearly six in 10 aged under 25 reporting feeling lonely most of the time. Major life transitions also make us more vulnerable, moving from school to work, from work to retirement, separation, the loss of a partner, all can potentially re reduce connections and leave us more isolated. We find that the loss of a partner especially and relationship breakdown has a significant impact on loneliness. And of course that's not at all surprising. But the loneliness endures well after the life event has happened, for five years, for a decade or more. And people who have built resources and social capital during their working lives look forward to retirement, but it's still an isolating experience for some, especially single retirees for whom work provides a mitigation against loneliness. We also look at how loneliness varies by income and for those living below a poverty line of half of a typical or median income scale for family size. And the results are both compelling and disturbing. People in the lowest income decile are more than twice as likely to report being very lonely for most of the time compared to those in the highest decile. More than a quarter of the poorest tenth of people feel lonely most of the time, and nearly four in 10 single parents in poverty feel isolated. Of course, material deprivations have a part to play in these results. People on lower incomes are less able to afford social activities, events, travel, or participate in common interests. But the loneliness gap between the richest and the poorest remains significant even when we control for a host of other characteristics. Just uh, the dotted lines in this chart. And so these findings provide further evidence of something that we've been highlighting at BCC for many years now. That poverty gets under the skin. Poverty scars you. Poverty is an isolating experience. Loneliness for those in poverty comes from a sense of helplessness from being excluded from so many of the things that most of us take for granted, and from an inability to see any escape in the future. It restricts activity, reduces freedom and choice. And so it's no wonder that poverty leaves people feeling lonely and excluded and undermines their sense of belonging and self-worth. Ashley. Thanks, Alan. COVID-19 imposed limits on the amount and especially the nature of our interactions due to physical distancing requirements. What I'd like to do now is to take you through changes in social interactions, community participation, and trust over the course of the pandemic, and ask the question, are the new ways of working and interacting contributing to loneliness in our society? I want to start with looking at how engagement with family and friends has evolved between 2019 and 2020. We see a significant drop in the levels of weekly face-to-face -face contact with family and friends living outside of the household across Australia presented on the left. The largest drop is seen in Victoria, the state most impacted by the restrictions. 
So has face-to-face -face communication with our family and friends been replaced by online communication? Not really. Based on the analysis presented on the right-hand side of this figure, we see a modest drop in non-face-to-face -face contact too. So, what these two pieces of analysis jointly convey is that overall we are having less contact with family and friends post-COVID. Not only have COVID-19 restrictions impacted our engagements with family and friends, they have also affected engagement with social groups, community support groups, and civic and political groups. Here, we see significant drops in engagement for both men and women. Our state-by-state -state analysis reveals that Queensland and Victoria have experienced some of the largest drops in participation in groups and communities. But it is not all bad news. The pandemic has had some positive impacts as well. We relied heavily on public institutions, such as healthcare and police, to provide information, manage public health measures, and to ensure compliance to public restrictions. During 2020, trust in these institutions has gone up. We see the largest increase in trust in the healthcare system, a rise by 10 percentage points. The share of people agreeing that most people in society can be trusted has also gone up from 55% in 2019 to 61% in 2020. Now, there has been a big shift to working from home over the past years, but especially since the onset of the pandemic. Working largely from home remains the new normal for many organizations and workers. Still, our physical workplaces provide great opportunities for us to socialize. Working from home may thus limit the scope for that particular type of socialization, although it may also create more space for socializing within the family or with neighbors. So does the extent of working from home matter for loneliness? This figure shows that it clearly does. With an increase in the share of hours usually work from home, there is an increase in the share of individuals who report being often lonely. Around 19% of those working over 80% of their time from home so say they're often lonely in red here, compared to only 10% of those working from home less than 10% of their time. So it is likely that physical workplaces and face-to-face -face contact may mitigate social isolation and loneliness. Now, another development of recent years, but particularly the COVID period, is increasing digital modes of interaction. With restrictions on face-to-face -face contact in place in the course of 2020, many Australians relied on social media to maintain their social connections. But what can we say about the relationship between social media use and levels of loneliness? Our analysis suggests that loneliness, in fact, goes up with increasing frequency of social media use, shown on the left here, particularly for young women. 17% of young women who never posted on social media or did so rarely reported being lonely. In comparison, over 28% of young women who posted once or more a day were lonely, a difference of 11 percentage points. Our analysis of pre-COVID data on the right here suggests that in the general population, 54% of Australians who had mostly or entirely non-digital interaction with family and friends never felt left out compared to 41 of those who had most or all of their social contact through the internet. So, digital interactions may not be the answer for social isolation and loneliness. Over to Alan to take you through the impacts and economic costs of loneliness. Fantastic. Humans need to connect and feel they belong, but increasingly our modern way of life is making meaningful community participation harder and less satisfying. And loneliness affects people in so many ways. People who become lonely visit their GPs more often and present at hospitals more frequently. Social isolation is also associated with high rates of smoking and alcohol dependence and less physical activity, and sick people get lonely. Those with serious illness are more likely to be lonely and report less social support and less interpersonal trust. Nearly half of older age women who are often lonely take little or no exercise compared to a third of those that aren't. Loneliness is associated with elevated psychological distress, especially for, lone, uh, for, for younger people. And people who become lonely make up to four more visits to their GP each year, and up to six more for those who remain lonely. So to put an indicative value on the cost of loneliness to Australia, we compare a series of health outcomes and behaviors for people who either become or remain lonely against those that don't. This includes differences in the number of GP and hospital visits, prevalence of daily smoking, excess alcohol consumption, 
physical inactivity, and sick days taken. Indicative unit costs are then applied to each variation in health outcome and scaled to reflect the projected number of people in Australia who become or remain lonely each year. The most significant contributions to overall economic cost of loneliness come from a greater incidence of regular smoking, the higher number of GP and hospital visits, more physical inactivity, and excess alcohol consumption. A greater share of the cost of loneliness come from the impact on women. And we find that young women account for more than three quarters of the cost of loneliness within their own cohort. And seniors for more than a third of the economic cost of loneliness associated with GP and hospital visits and physical inactivity. And taken together, our analysis puts the cost of, of loneliness conservatively at around $2.7 billion each year an equivalent annual cost of nearly $1,600 for each person who becomes lonely. So what can we do to get on top of the loneliness pandemic? One of the best remedies for loneliness is participation in activities that create meaningful connections and a common purpose. For some, that might mean sport, hobbies, or common interests. For others, this may be volunteering with a local charity or community organization. Ironically, in a new digital world, engaging online and connecting through social media isn't always the answer. It works for some, but for others, the connection can be unsatisfying and lack meaning. And the move to online service delivery can actually increase social isolation. The risk is especially acute for seniors who may not have the resources or the confidence to engage effectively with online services and who miss out on the security from face-to-face -face contact with service providers. In our view, government should ensure that the move towards online service delivery doesn't lessen the quality of face-to-face -face engagement with vulnerable, isolated sections of society. We should also consider social prescribing options for GPs to manage the health costs of loneliness. And there's a strong economic case for investment in community initiatives that build social networks and connections to place, encourage physical activity, and most importantly, give a sense of purpose and belonging. So over to Ashid now to close. Ashid. Thanks, Alan. Our connectedness matters. It is critical to our health and well-being. It plays a crucial role in helping us to navigate through major life transitions, to respond to personal crises, and to bounce back afterwards. Yet the pandemic has amplified the trends of growing disconnectedness and loneliness in our society. Young people and seniors, people with disability or serious illness, indigenous Australians, and migrants from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds are more likely to feel lonely and unsupported. Major life transitions also make us vulnerable. Moving from school to work, from work to retirement, separation or loss of a partner can all reduce our connections. Humans need to connect and feel they belong. But increasingly, our modern way of life is making meaningful community participation harder and less satisfying. Lonely people are more likely to be sick, and the sick are more at risk of being lonely. Our findings suggest that increasing loneliness comes at a high cost to our society and that mitigating loneliness could reduce demands on our health systems, improve community connectedness, and enhance personal well-being through the life course. Social connectedness is fundamental to our resilience and our capacity to respond to crisis. As we face some of the, our greatest challenges as a planet, it is critical we get smarter in understanding that we are all just parts of a bigger community and in supporting each other in becoming stronger together. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's what happens for those of you who saw that when they give you an iPad, a phone, a clipboard, notepads, paper, everything ends up on the floor and we start again. <laughs> um, but we're all good. Thank you so much to Professor Alan Duncan and Associate Professor Astrik Mavisakalyan. Would you give them another big round of applause? Uh, now, if you haven't already and you'd like to submit some questions, now's a good time because I'm going to introduce our panellists and I have been looking through the iPad there and we've already got some fantastic questions, so thank you. Please feel free to keep submitting those and I will, uh, with Alan and Astrid having their seats at the end there of the panel, I'll introduce to you now our other panellists. Please make them welcome. We have Christine Allen, the Chief Executive Officer of the Council on the Ageing in WA. Brendan Cullinan, Chief Executive Officer, People with Disabilities, Western Australia. 
uh, and Nick Maisie, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Befriend. We got mics on. Is this, can you hear me as I was? Isn't that amazing? You can still hear me. Uh, we're all mic'd up. We're wired up, ready to go. Um, and our panel are eager to answer your questions. So I'm just going to, by way of introduction as well, it's good to get the reaction of our panelists <coughs> to the, the mic's on, <laughs> to, the, to, <laughs> to that report, the findings um, in their particular area of expertise. So I'll start with Christine, closest to me. Uh, CEO, Council on the Aging, and I'm wondering if you might start off for us, Christine, with um, the findings that you think resonate most for you in relation to the challenges that older West Australians do face regarding loneliness and isolation. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, I think this report is really important at this time in an ageing population right across the world. And what we've seen in this report, I guess, is what we already know, that it is the vulnerable uh, cohorts who are feeling the disadvantage more than anybody else. And so that might be people with a disability. It might be people who don't have English as a first language. It might be people from an Aboriginal background. And so it's really important that reports like this can highlight uh, the issues that these people are facing, particularly so that we can start to look at solutions uh, as we see, uh, you know, our population starting to age and have an impact on the whole of society. Thank you. I'll keep moving along and, Brendan, ask you for... I mean, it's a fairly worrying picture that the report paints when it comes to social isolation for people with disabilities. Um, what do you think could be better done, I guess, to resolve the impact of isolation and lo loneliness for people with disabilities? The, the first point is to that, that recognition that there's a range of systemic, attitudinal and uh, physical barriers that people with disability actually face. And that comes from a, a conscious or subconscious position of, of ableism in today's society. And any solutions that you're looking at must have that true co-design approach and be developed by people with disabilities. If you look at the issue regarding um, poverty, about why is it actually occurring? Well, in relation to for people who are unable to work or limited capacity to work, their ability to access disability support pension, the complexities around that, is uh, of obviously concern at the moment. And there's a range of reports that have highlighted that the, the barriers for people to navigate the whole Centrelink system to comply with Centrelink uh, is obviously a concern in actually accessing disability support pension. We look at the employment side about there's a, obviously the figures show that a person with a disability is 43% less likely to be working than somebody without a disability. So why is that occurring? The ways that we can start to improve that is regarding training and education, how we try and get more focused uh, training within the school system that are, work, that are developing students' abilities for workforce. We look at the uh, disability employment services that they are more the quality and services and the accountability around that side. Uh, if we look at trying to eliminate uh, segregated workforces that currently exist under the Australian Disability Enterprises, so we actually get people that are engaged more in Main Street work and, work and actually focus on more resources around that. I'll come to you, Nick, in a minute. I wonder if we might just get a quick comment from each of you two, firstly, Christine and Brendan, then, because this is going to be a theme, and I can see from some of the questions coming in already, around technology. And I just wonder if I might get a quick response from each of you then about whether you see technology as a solution to some of these issues or in the fact, you know, in the case of seniors, it might be a bit more of a, you know, a disadvantage. What are your thoughts, both of you, Christine, maybe firstly on technology and its use? Okay, so what we know is that COVID uh, didn't cause some of the factors that affected older people. It just highlighted them. So older people, when COVID struck, older people were told to go inside close the door, do your banking online, do your shopping online, have a doctor's appointment online and socialise with your family and friends online. And as a result, what have we seen through that? We've seen a massive spike in elder abuse, financial elder abuse against older people. And we've seen um, scams 
escalating off the scale with the target of older people. So we've seen, we know that older people, and I think this report found some of that, we know that older people have attempted to go online to do their banking because they needed to. But it's not their preferred method of um, transacting. And so we are forcing a whole generation of people to take up something that they don't feel safe with, they don't feel comfortable with, and the evidence is there to suggest that it's not working. And from a, a disability side, the COVID, there are a range of assumptions made through COVID that had unintended consequences. So it assumed that people with this disability had the actual technology, had the internet access, yeah. and that the inform information was accessible, which wasn't the actual case. So therefore, people didn't have the uh, capabilities of accessing some information, or it wasn't there for them. Or it had situations like if you could order um, groceries online to be delivered to your house. But that's not much good if you've got physical impairment that you can't actually get those grocery bags into your house. So there's a whole range of unintended consequences that occurred. Good points. Um, let's introduce Nick Macy. Thank you so much for coming along and joining us on the panel today. Nick, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about what Befriend is, first of all, and how and why you started it. Absolutely. Um, well, I know that this is a really heavy, like, emotional topic that sits with us. But I love my work because, in case the name didn't give it away, um, my work is the work of friendship. And what beautiful work to be doing with people. Um, Befriend is something that I've been working on with a collective of people for the last 11 years. We're a community building organisation. And our work is really about working in partnership with local residents, local councils, community organisations, clubs and associations to grow local community networks of friendship, mutual aid and support so that people, all of us really, are growing up and living in local neighbourhoods as community contexts that are inclusive, welcoming and connected. So Nick, tell us then, you've heard now from this, this report is finding that loneliness and social disconnection are a growing problem. With the work that you do, are there any factors that you would like to contribute that might be behind that? I think that there are a lot of amazing things that the research has really drawn upon. And, you know, just to the points that Christine and Brendan have been making, some of these things have been present for a really long time. I think that this all takes place within a social context and an attitudinal set where different forms of prejudice and discrimination have meant that many different people have been experiencing different forms of disconnection for a very long time on the basis of gender, age, sexual orientation, culture, language, ethnicity, different forms of diversity that are resulting in people experiencing social devaluation and, and therefore loneliness and, and isolation as a result. But I think that it's really interesting also for us to reflect on this busy society context that we all live in. I know that through the, the people that we have conversations with in local neighbourhoods around what undermines them taking action to spend time with friends, neighbours, family, and really invest in nurturing and growing these, like, these relationships is this busyness that we sit with so strongly. We're constantly connected to so many different forms of activity that our minds are racing and connected with all of these different possible experiences that are undermining our ability to be present with each other, even when we might actually be together in a physical space. And they're reducing our opportunities to actually spend time in all sorts of different experiences that are fundamentally relational. Thank you. Um, we will get to your questions in just a moment and you can direct them either to an individual on the panel or to the panel as a whole, whatever you'd like to do with that. Um, but we have a, uh, a student question first up. Have we got a microphone near Jack? Who's got it? Yes. Jack from Rockingham Senior High School. Your first cab off the rank. What would you like to ask? Working? Oh, yep. sweet. Um, during this COVID period, is the reason for younger women having a higher loneliness, loneliness rate due to the typically higher number of members within social groups? Look, so it did surprise us. There's, um, there's a paradox uh, behind 
um, uh, behind the sort of prevalence of loneliness amongst uh, young women in this age. Um, and I think, I mean, f for us, it's, it's the sort of imperfect substitute of having hundreds of Facebook friends against, you know, a few the connections that you would have, sort of, um, uh, you know, face-to-face -face connections uh, uh, or, or, or friends that, 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 sort of, uh, that collect together and commune together. Um, so we get the sense that underlying these figures is, is that, that sort of imperfect substitute of friendships that are online. I think there's also something going on around, uh, around how social, social media communicates you know, sort of ideals that perhaps um, people, as they're forming identities, um, uh, maybe sort of worry about or feel that they don't measure up. Uh, and so that sort of signaling that comes through social media, I think, can in and of itself be isolating. Because if you, if you think that you don't belong, then a response is potentially to withdraw and to self-isolate. So, so I think that there's a, there are complex stories behind what is quite a paradoxical uh, result in, in the digital world. Um, but I think it's really important that this has come through in this research. But it's also come through in a lot of other work. Um, Commissioner for Children and Young People um, uh, uh, and his, his officers uh, released work, which is very much in that same space and, and finding the same sort of results. So I think we're, uh, we're, we're, we really need to start to address some of these issues, which I think are confirmed. The work that we've done, I think, confirms a lot of other work in this area. Thanks, Jack, for your question. I'll uh, go off the iPad now and ask our panel some of the questions that you've submitted. So thank you very much for that. And this is a, a fairly general one. I'd be keen for your thoughts uh, on a few of our different panellists here. Lisa Dodd from Bank West has submitted this question. How can organisations better support their colleagues with enhancing connection and having impact on changing feelings of isolation and belonging? So what can organisations do better? What do our panellists think? Shall I start with you, that one? Why not? Okay. Organisations can, and we're talking in respect to older people, can actually answer the phone, I guess, rather than having automated <laughs> services. Uh, we get a lot of feedback from older people about that. Um, really important, as we know, face-to-face -face talk to older people or give them information in a written format and don't direct them to a website, which, particularly if it's a complex website, and a lot of them are, um, really the way we engage with older people really needs to be in their preferred format and not the preferred format of the um, provider of the service or the information. Well, it's following on from that. It's about the accessibility of information. So that's probably a key barrier that people with disabilities face. So whether information is provided in an easy read, Auslan interpretation, so videos. So it's about having that information that's accessible for a broad range of disabilities. I think that um, I guess I'm really drawn to the organisation's role in creating a cultural environment where people are truly valued and appreciated for their unique gifts and their strengths, and what does that look like in the ways in which we celebrate people in the context of a workplace? Mm. I think so much of connectedness really goes hand in hand with being valued for one's unique self. Mm. And I think that there are lots of creative cultural ways that that can be engaged with. I'd also like to draw organisations to consider the impacts that working hours and the availability of staff at many different hours of the day and week can unintentionally undermine people's time and participation with family, friends, neighbours and community. So a real mindfulness to balance in an employee's lives within and outside work is really important consideration from my perspective. That's great. I love how you went from within organisations and you yep. two are more externally yeah, talking about it. I would probably add to that. Again, it's about, and going back to that working environment, it's about obviously organisations analysing their, their physical environment, their systems and policies to ensure that it doesn't have that ableist lens. It's about identifying the diversity that disability brings to a particular workforce and providing those opportunities and not actually putting up barriers. And I didn't see the show last night, but there was on Q&A about a discrimination case against a particular person. 
there can be that subconscious ableism that occurs that does create those particular barriers which does contribute to isolation. Do you guys want to add anything? COVID-19 was an interesting natural experience in making us realize how meaningful the face-to-face -face interactions that we have in the workplace are. Um, a lot of us in academia have been missing these face-to-face -face seminars and presentations and just being really tired of the, just presenting to your screen and um, just, just, you know, I guess um, just realizing that how important and meaningful these interactions are for our productivity as well. Um, but then I uh, agree with Nick in terms of uh, just, just uh, the, the significance of uh, work-life balance in making sure that, um, yeah, that the, the sort of uh, in feeding into our overall well-being. You could argue that a lot of the technological advances that we've been dealing with free up some time that we could meaningfully then use for leisure and socializing. Um, however, we need to also be mindful of the fact that the time that is freed up and uh, out of you know, socialization that happens in the workplace may actually not be then going into socializing in other ways. And for people, uh, for certain groups of our society, the physical workplaces are a place where a lot of that socializing is happening. All right, we'll move on to our next question. Um, now, this I'll read the question submitted by Paula Rogers. This is a bit of a similar theme, though, on the issue of gender differences. Paula has summed up a couple of your questions, so if I don't read your specific one, Paula asks, do you think the gender gap in loneliness is because women are better at articulating their feelings? There are a couple of similar questions to that. Um, maybe, maybe I'll start with you then. Closest to me, Christine. Okay. Um, I read somewhere years ago that, I can't remember the, the number, but women use three times as many words per day as men. <laughs> and so I think we, we are more verbose. And so isolation, I'm not surprised, has a bigger impact on women. Um, I, I don't know that we'll ever change that. I think that it will affect. Women are more social creatures. Um, yeah, I, ju I just think that's, I don't know that there's any solution well, The other woman that. on the panel there is putting her <laughs> hand up. Yes. So one thing that is notable um, is that in our report we find that there are uh, differences by cultural background in the loneliness gender gap with certain cultural backgrounds uh, showing, you know, men, sort of the, the loneliness gap in the reverse uh, direction. Uh, what this potentially suggests is that in certain cultural contexts, for example, it could be there could be more stigma attached as a man to confessing of loneliness. Um, um, but but yeah, I guess that's just worthwhile to highlight that there are these cultural differences in gender loneliness gaps, and not every uh, you know every group in Australia um, uh, has a situation whereby uh, women tend to report more loneliness. Do you guys want to talk about that anymore? Uh, Maybe well, this is in relation to the range of activities that are available at particular age groups and stuff, from male to female, so probably yeah, not much more. All right. Well, let, well, let's go to a different demographic. We'll go to an age-type question here, because this is from our PLC students. Thank you for this. How can... Oh, it just jumped off my screen. There it is. How can we, as school students, address these concerns around social connectedness mm -hmm. and more broadly make direct change? Good on you for wanting to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose from my thoughts is that the way that the state connected, so they obviously have a broad range of opportunities. And I've had, I've got adult children now, but I know that through their teenage years, yes, that online connectedness was very important, but that this needs to be that physical connection as well. So I think getting the actual balance between the online, identifying the importance of that, but it needs to be also that physical connection as well through either informal or formal opportunities. All right, I've got a question for you, I reckon, Nick. This is just a general one, but I reckon you're the best one for this. This is from Anonymous. <laughs> but it's a, a really good point that we live in a more individualised society, not extending to the care of others. What can be done to return the sense of more broader community responsibility? Yeah, it's a great question. Isn't it? I really Stop looking after ourselves and look out for each other. Yeah. I, I certainly share that perspective, that I do think that this is everyone's responsibility. I think that connection uh, and life as a whole will look different for each of us because we're all so unique. But it is certainly something important for us to reflect on in terms of 
What are the things that we value in our life? Mm. How are we living our life day to day at the moment? What does the alignment look like between what, what our values are and how we're living our life? What's out of alignment? And what might it look like for us at a personal individual level to bring more alignment back into that picture? To reflect on how we are exercising our own participation in our friendships, our neighbourly relationships, our family relationships. It's work for us all. Do you want to add to that, Christine or Brendan, just in a general sort of context? So we know that, uh, I, I read something the other day that said about 50% of us know our neighbours. And so if you asked that question probably 30, 40 years ago, everybody would have known their neighbours. Um, we live now where we can probably not so much in COVID, but we can move overseas, we can move into state, we can take up jobs. We tend to live away from our families more so than, say, 50 years ago. And so we're losing that connection and we're all very busy. And if you look at traditional lifestyles 50 years ago, we had the man that worked and the woman that didn't. And we had the tradition, particularly in other cultures, where uh, you looked after ageing parents um, all of those traditions have gone, you know, in most cases, out of the window. And we're all living busy lives. We're working longer. Um, we've got parents working, both parents working. So there's a complete lifestyle change, I think, over the last 50 years that's seen us disconnect from each other. Uh, and technology has both helped that but also it's having a negative impact, as we've seen from this report. Alan? If I can reinforce um, uh, 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 what uh, Nick and uh, Christine have said, and, and we have to say that in preparing this report, you know, it does give one pause for thought uh, around whether or not we, we, we are getting it right, and uh, I think in many respects, no. Um, Ashley was mentioning you know, how how the sort of you know the value of those incidental interactions uh, in the workplace were really exposed during the course of COVID, but I think it's the same in everyday life. You know what you might regard as just an incidental um, uh, interaction with somebody to them might be a really meaningful interaction. You know, just you know, just a, a, an engagement in a in a coffee house or on the street, just some sort of interpersonal um, uh, you know communication. Can, can, can make the world of difference to someone's day. And it, as I say, it's certainly given me pause for thought about the extent to which you know, I reflect on whether or not I'm doing you know, enough in that respect. Yeah. Thank you. We'll move on to another question. This, this one is also anonymous, but we know that we have a crisis in this city and in this state with homelessness. So this question uh, relates to that. So it's probably one for the researchers saying, is stable housing or the lack thereof a direct cause of uh, or resulting direct cause of or a resulting impact of social disconnect and loneliness. Look, it's a it's a really complex question, of course, um, and uh, you know, of course, those on uh, on um, the fringes of of society or who or who you know from no fault of their own are excluded. Uh, from stable accommodation um, uh, or from access to, you know, basic income, there is that 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 has to be a hugely isolating experience. But I think there are all, also complexities around um, uh, you know, ho uh, uh, housing uh, those that have, you know, spent time uh, in in the homelessness, because if you take um, you know somebody uh, uh, from the street, somebody who's been homeless and put them in social housing in an environment which is completely alien, that in and of itself can also be isolating. You may have a stable home, a roof over your head, but you have no connection with your neighbourhoods, you have no connection to, uh, to, to friendships. And so I think there are some real complexities um, uh, in, in that homelessness space. Yeah. Uh, and this is a question that Brendan will be interested in from Simone. Was the measure for people with disabilities measured based on natural connections such as friends and family, or did it include their connections with their paid support workers? Um, 
So the data that we used, the household income labor dynamics in Australia survey didn't allow us to have that uh, distinction in uh, social interactions. In fact, it's likely that the connection with uh, the support uh, workers was not counted in simply because of the way the questions were framed. For example, the questions on interactions were framed with reference to interactions with friends, with neighbors. Um, so it's unlikely that we have been able to capture that part of the interaction. But we did explore uh, as part of the, um, uh, the analysis of drivers of loneliness and isolation, you know, a whole, a whole host of characteristics together. And, uh, and one of the, the, um, uh, the factors that we incorporated into some of that analysis was um, uh, the, you know, being a carer. Uh, and what emerged quite strongly is that controlling for a whole host of other characteristics, you know, the, the life of a carer can be quite isolating as well. Mm. Um, you know, heightened levels of loneliness and quite significantly heightened levels of loneliness amongst those that care for somebody else, either within or outside the household. Um, so, you know, it, again, uh, that, 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 I think that, that, that gives uh, an important insight into, uh, in, into, you know, the circumstances of those with caring responsibility. Can I just comment on the, the connection between housing and connection to family, friends and community? Obviously, it's very important that, that there is that ability to live where you have those connections, where you're part of that community, you're close to family and friends. So that comes back to accessible and affordable housing. Mm. So we know that for people with disabilities need some adaptations to the actual housing, so those choices aren't necessarily there. Mm. And it's pleasing to see, obviously, from the state government, they're going to be investing in social housing. But that needs to be, there needs to be a range of options there that people have choice to live where they want to live and not have to take options that are in totally isolated uh, suburbia, which is disconnected from their family and disconnected from their local community and facilities and stuff as well. Let's just explore this issue of technology again. We've got a specific question here, probably for you, Christine. But I'd just like to point out that, I mean, this is something that is close to my I host a lot of talkback radio shows at the moment on 6PR, and I know that through that we have a, an older cohort of listeners who are pretty lonely and use the radio for companionship. But also, on this issue of technology, they ring us, and every time we're talking about these issues, they say, but I don't have a smartphone. I don't have the internet, I don't have a smart TV or whatever we're talking about. And it's just constant feedback. And this question says, digital literacy for seniors is often a challenge due to the complexity of different types of devices. How can we standardise? And that seems like such an important point because everything is different and difficult, isn't it? Yep, yep. Look, uh, yeah, and there are so many different types of um, technology to use. So I do, and myself and my team at COTA do presentations every week. We go out and talk to seniors. And the first question we ask them is, hands up if you're using technology. If you're using a mobile phone, if you're using a tablet, if you're using a computer, are you connected to the internet? Probably 50% of the room would put their hand up. When we delve a little further and say, but how many of you are actually, actually actively using your technology? Of course, the feedback comes back. Well, my son gave me a, a mobile phone. My daughter set me up on Facebook. <laughs> but we don't really use it. It's just there for an emergency. And because they don't feel supported enough to use that technology or even safe enough to use that technology. So it is very confusing. And I don't know about the people in the audience, but I use a computer technology every day in my job. And I'm sure most of us have to. But I wouldn't still consider myself highly competent. And, you know, we've seen scams. I'm sure we all get them every day on our mobile phones or on emails. Some of them are very clever. So how do older people who are not used to this, this technology understand what's real and what isn't? And it's causing a lot of distress for older people. Thank you. Sorry, I'm looking through. There are so many questions here. I'd love to race through a couple reasonably quickly if we can, because there are so many. Uh, does loneliness reduce when you live with another person? And if so, should we be championing innovative housing models to better support connection at home? Well, we certainly, <coughs> um, 
uh, explore uh, patterns of difference in loneliness by you know, household composition, household setting. Um, uh, but most of those are in sort of fairly traditional and orthodox um, uh, household settings, sure. you know, rather than more innovative sort of, sh um, sort of shared space settings. Uh, so um, we'd love to be able to look at that topic more um, uh, in, in, with more granularity uh, than we're able to, but unfortunately for, for, for these data we can't. However, you know, I do think um, there are, you know, some opportunities, again, just following on from what Brendan was, uh, uh, was mentioning around design. You know, innovative design could actually take account of building community. Uh, and you know, uh, and I think you know that could include moving away from the more traditional uh, uh, accommodation settings. Yeah. I think I suppose relevant also to the age situation that if you have like a, a group home situation, that yes, that may help with regards to loneliness, but so long as the person has choice and control in their life, mm. and they're not sort of seen as one particular group, but allow seen as an individual, and they have choice and control in their daily life. John says you show women are more connected but also more lonely. Why? <laughs> it's the million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, I mean, might be a, just a difference of uh, needs. <laughs> um, and the way you see relationships and how they, how they work. Uh, but again, I think uh, it's important to emphasize the socialization, the significance of socialization, and that that's not observed uh, homogeneously throughout the society. Um. And again, you know, just return to the point that, um, you know, what, what do we actually mean by connection? You know, does having 500 Facebook friends mean that you're, you know, connected, uh, uh, that you're included, that you're meaningfully engaging. Um, um, I don't, I, I don't subscribe to Facebook, so I don't know. But, um, uh, but you know, I think, I think these are valid questions. You know, what, re what represents a sort of genuine equality you know, and a valued connection? Perhaps it's not quite what we believe it to be. This, uh, this conversation around gender too is, um, making me feel the need to make a comment that's not directly in response to that question, but more to make a, a general comment that we know that there's more to gender than male and female, and that I think it's really important for us to acknowledge trans and gender diverse people and their unique experiences of discrimination, marginalization, loneliness, and isolation too. Yeah, sure. Um, and Nick, this, this might be a question for you because it sounds a bit similar to what you do. The question says, are the researchers aware of the network of neighbourhood and community resource centres in WA? 150 grassroots organisations creating social connections. Look, um, yeah, we are. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, they, I think they fulfil um, a really valuable role. I think there was... Uh, there were some issues or insecurities around um, or um, uh, uncertainties around the resourcing of CRCs, um, but I think that's been resolved. And so in that respect, you know, I think uh, it's a good thing because it's highlighted just the value of CRCs uh, within their, their, their local um, uh, uh, areas. But I think there are also some challenges around those that work in CRCs where, you know, progressively more of their time is taken with navigating online services and navigating, you know, Centrelink online, which can then take away from the time where you can have a more holistic check-in with those that visit the CRC, uh, then I think that risks, uh, you know, some of the power that, um, that the community resource centres, uh, you, know, you know, actually you know, enjoyed in, in, in connecting people and, um, and providing a triage service if, if, you know, particular challenges or issues are identified. So, I think CRCs uh, and, the, and, the, and the neighbourhood centres are you know, a tremendously important component of, of connectivity and, and for, for isolated groups in particular. Uh, and this question says to Brendan and Christine, what is your perception about COVID's impact on ageism and exclusion or discrimination, particularly re public comments on specific groups? Well, I suppose, yeah, we had concerns about the whole vaccine type situation and, and how that, I suppose, got a bit sort of changed. Um, and I think it comes back a bit to, I suppose, that people with disabilities have the, the rights of everybody else. And I suppose there are vulnerabilities around that and that needs to be sort of recognised from that side. That I think that 
It's not the fact that uh, there are, they're more deserving of the particular support. They actually, that's a, a right that they should actually have. And it's not as if it's doing something extraordinary. It's just a basic human right, identifying those vulnerabilities. Uh, from my perspective, um, ageism is rife, and not just against older people, uh, you know, against different generations. It's, it's definitely out there. Um, age discrimination is something that we're becoming more and more aware of, and the age at which people are being discriminated against is reducing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about mature age employment, you know, it used to be if you were 60, you were discriminated against. We're now talking about people 45 and over. And uh, th that will be a massive issue. We saw COVID when a lot of people lost their jobs. Um, usually the first ones out the door were older people. And so there's no doubt it's happening. It's something that is hard to prove, I guess. Um, it's, it's there, but I think the onus is on all of us to, to call it out and to look for it and to be um, aware of it. That's where our students can help. We were your age five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're at just about out of time. Two quick ones. This one's a one-word response, I reckon. Does having a pet help loneliness? One-word response. Does it? Yes. Yes. Pet helps. And this one I wanted to get in because it is, it's a good West Australian question, really, about FIFO workers and also about being... Oh, it's jumped off my screen about being... Re there, uh, no, it's jumped off my screen. It was about re being regional and remote people and also FIFO workers about are they at greater risk of loneliness and, and a lack of connection? Anyone? From disability, yeah, obviously, yes. In relation to available services, but there can also be strength in regional communities as well. So I think more so service aspects, but there can also be a stronger sense of community in regional areas. What the report finds is that in remote areas, people are um, less, uh, they socialize less. However, there is more interpersonal trust compared to uh, urban and uh, regional areas. Okay, we are out of time for our panel questions. There were so many more. We got through lots. Thank you so much for submitting all of those questions. I hope we did get through most of them. And please, would you thank all of our panelists, Christine, Brendan, Nick, Astrick, and Alan. Thank you very much. You can now exit the stage. Thank you very much for your attention during all that as well. That was a really helpful discussion on so many of those key issues from the report. Very intelligent questions, so thank you. And I'm just going to introduce Professor Chris Moran, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Curtin University, to now deliver our vote of thanks. Thank you, good afternoon. I'll try not to keep you too long. On behalf of Curtin, I'd like to congratulate the authors of the report. You've seen the full list of of names up there for an in-depth analysis of the trends in loneliness and social connectedness. And I'm sure we've all been thinking of our personal lives as we've been sitting here today, in particular to thank Professor Alan Duncan and Associate Professor um, Ashtik Mavis Sakalan uh, for sharing the highlights today. Um, I, I just wanted to pull out a few things that I think, uh, some messages here that were, I think, fairly consistent almost from the first speaker to the last. And, and, and I'll, I'll start with the, what, what seems like the negative part of the, the day and what uh, I think, Nick, you described as heavy. Um, I think it was a really good word for it, certainly how I was feeling until you, and, until you used it and named it. Three million people lonely most of the time. It's higher for women, particularly young women and older women. Again, women. Disabled, one third of disabled men, uh, women and a quarter of disabled men. Broken relationships, loneliness that endures. Poverty, again. Working from home, leading to loneliness. Requiring more medical attention and those startling figures, again, of seeing the, uh, the females, young females in this case, on that really heavy part of the agenda. The role of technology has been discussed a lot, hasn't it? The herding instinct of technology. I think part of the answer to the question from the from the students is if you've got 500 followers and 498 of them have a go at you one night, that, that's, a pretty heavy, that's a pretty heavy effect. And this effect of, of, of exclusion of someone being your inclusion mechanism is something I think that, that occurs quite a lot in those environments because you can fire off a message pretty fast uh, and getting 300 of them on the other side of it, it's not necessarily a very, uh, 
inclusive experience. Just one, one reflection. Certainly a lot of reflections from the panel though on, on technology, I, I, don't, I, I don't think we needed a pandemic and I don't think we need age and we don't need a study of loneliness for us all to wish someone would answer the phone. <laughs> so what about COVID? I think right again from the beginning, the novelty factor, it was nice to be at home. I enjoyed being with my wife and kids. I enjoyed some of that time, but then the perversities that came from that and then the fatigue that came from that. I am now having people, I'm sure you are as well, saying, can you just call me? I can't stand another Zoom meeting. It's not that I don't like your face, Chris. It's just, can we do it on the phone, kind of old style, just talk to one another on, on, on the phone. And this constant message that COVID has exacerbated things that were already there. A lot of things, there are a lot of these things that have come up today and other times, things that were there in society that have now been magnified and amplified in front of our eyes. And, and you know, there's one thing we can do about that, which is to grab those things and turn them around and say, well, what insight does that give us? And today we've seen a lot of it again, haven't we? Gender, poverty, disabled, older people, there they are again, they come up again and again. And we can ignore them, we can blame COVID or we can begin to look at what we do with those insights. And let, let me end with some of the things that I, that I heard and saw today. Volunteering, giving, not receiving. Giving something is what volunteering is about. If you give something to someone else, what you receive in response to that is magnified. The increased trust in institutions that came out. Therefore, if you're an institution, you have an opportunity to do something about that. We heard some discussion. What do you do inside your institution? And then what does your institution do? You're a government department, you're, you're not an empty black box. For us as a university, we've had a conundrum. We have these beautiful places where people love to come, but they don't want to be taught there. They don't want to be lectured at there. They definitely want to learn there and they want to be with each other there. We're having huge discussions in our sector all over the country, perhaps all over the world. We have these wonderful places where people come. What's their role in connecting, not just to the students, but to the surrounding communities? Can we be more open places? Can we be less intimidating places? Can we be less intimidating people for uh, uh, at where people can come to, to interact with one another? Work flexibility. We have an uh, amazing situation in a lot of places where people are saying, we want to work more flexibly, but we don't want to be left alone at home lonely. So we as institutions have got to figure that out. It's really quite a challenge to figure out how you have people coming and going getting work done in very different ways, but also allowing that social connectivity when people come to work. Last thing we want to do is say, go sit in your cubicle, don't bother anybody else because they're not here very often. That's not, going to, that's not going to give the kind of connectivity that we're talking about. There's some wonderful institutional examples, I think, out there of where institutions have said, we don't actually care how long it takes you to do things. Here are the things you need to do. If you can do it in two days, that's great. The other three are yours. And there's increasing numbers of studies that are showing that people are motivated then. We found that during COVID. I'd have people quietly sending me emails or quietly calling me saying, it's Tuesday and I've finished. <laughs> and I just say to them, we'll either do some more, help someone out or kind of walk the dog, do the exercise. Like we, we, we've got to figure out how this operates uh, better for ourselves, I think. School students, there's a wonderful example. It's, I think it's real, I think it's the Netherlands, but I think we see more examples where young people are living with old people. Young people are giving homes, are given homes with older people in the institutions where the older people are isolated and the feedback for the younger people has been remarkable. They're the ones reporting on it. The younger people are sending out the messages going, you can't believe what I'm learning, I can't believe what I'm learning. I'm actually really keen to go home to this place. Now, there's more undergraduate students, I think, than school students, but that question of where to be or be in those places, talk to those people, tell them about Facebook. Alan, I can set you up a Facebook login. <laughs> and then uh, friendship and partnership, two things that you put out there straight away, friendship and partnership, uh, that, that question of uh, am I connected to someone, either physically or, or in a technology sense, but, um, but, but am I interacting with that person irrespective of whether it's online or offline, how, long do you, how often do you think I should look at the camera of my monitor, not look at where the person is on my screen? It's a weird thing to do, isn't it? Because you're staring at this camera and your eyes just want to look at the human, but you know that if you're not looking at the camera, they don't feel like you're looking at them. Are you mindful of that to try to make some other level of connection? All right, I'm all there except for one thing. I, I, I read a thing that, that didn't seem relevant the other day. I, I, do, I read it on Twitter. 
so this might be rubbish, but it, but it was an interesting one in reflection of today, which was a, a group of young people who'd been travelling together overseas, and they hadn't, they were friends, but they hadn't travelled together, and they were in a particular country, and, and they were talking amongst themselves, a couple of them, of the how this place was incredibly friendly, but they'd never been to such a friend, friendly place before, and they were walking down the street at one stage, and one of them turned around, and they realised that the girl who was with them was smiling at everybody as she was walking down the street. And their exclamation was, it's you. You're doing it. You're making them all smile at us. And I think there was a great message in there. So, to close today's report launch on behalf of Curtin University, I'd like to thank John Hart, the Chief Risk Officer, for your opening and, and I think very heartfelt comments on behalf of the bank and, and yourself. I can see that clearly. A, a fantastic welcome to country today. I, I, I'm really enjoying the welcomes to country where, where people are speaking in language and they're not translating leaving us just to hear language and, and, and giving some message of language without having to translate. And we, we, we had a lot of that today. And uh, Elizabeth Hayden, obviously an inspired individual with her comments about preference for universities. <laughs> I, could, I couldn't help it. Um, thanks very much to our panel members today. Christine Allen, Chief Executive Officer, Council of the Aging in Western Australia. Nick Maisie, Chief Executive Officer and founder of BeFriend, um, BeFriendly, Find Partnerships. I'll take that one away today. Brendan Cullinan, Chief Executive Officer, People with Disabilities, Western Australia. I'd like to congratulate Mark Gibson, uh, our MC. The way you got through so many questions, Mark, that was remarkable. Um, that was really well done. Students, thank you for coming. Thank you for questioning. Be part of the conversation. I, I went out to a school, I won't mention it, it wasn't one of yours, to, to look at whether my small child should go to whichever school and there was a reference by both the principal and as we were walking around of this concept of infantilizing, that is treating young people as though they're babies. And when you turn up and you participate in these conversations and you challenge and you bring forward who you are as individuals, it, it's our privilege that you do that. So thank you very much for coming today. Uh, thank you all for attending the event. I hope the holiday season is one of relaxation, uh, social connection, and we look forward to seeing you in 2022 for more BCEC events. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Professor Chris Moran for those closing remarks. Thank you all for coming so much today and for participating in this event. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to check out the BCEC website for more information, bcec.edu.au. And Look, you're right, there's a lot of people have used that word now about it being a bit heavy. Some of the findings might even, in fact, be a bit sad. But I want to, I always like to put a positive th spin on things. And to do that in closing, I think we're all in a pretty unique position today, having heard about this report and its findings, to now go ahead and do something good. So when you go home and across this weekend, how about we all sort of pledge to look out for someone a bit older than us, look out for someone living with a disability, Look out for someone from a multicultural or linguistically diverse background, because if we can all um, be a more inclusive society, check on our neighbours, check on our relatives, check on our friends, um, because a more inclusive society is certainly, as we've learned from that report, a better society, and it will help us all in the long run, financially, economically, health-wise, and in all living a better life. So thank you very much for coming along today. Thanks for your attention and attendance. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.